Yes, this, this alkene is stereogenic. That one is not. Yeah. Right? Uh, what is this? One, one, pro, uh, one pentene? Yeah, what is this? Two pentene? But, it's, but that's not entirely clear over there because it's stereogenic. What's the name of the compound over there? Trans 2 pentene, yes. Right? Trans 2 pentene, this is just one pentene, it's not stereogenic. The alkene here, the, uh, the, the alkene having two substituents there, that's uh, in that configuration, uh, you have stereochemistry possibilities. Cis and trans, it's called stereogenic. The, the, the structure gives rise to stereochemistry. Uh, which one, which route is more exothermic? Which reaction is more exothermic? Uh, reaction coordinate diagram, yeah. Well, we, I don't know if we labeled these before. We can call that one A, B, and they both go into C. Uh, they're both going to C. A and B, they're both higher. They have pi bond instead of uh, sigma bonds. Uh, which one's higher, A or B? A. A sits higher. So that's A, that's B. Uh, here we go now. We have just a transition state where the darts and two, two H's are being shot in from the metal catalyst, the <coughs> intermediate. Um, they start differently, but they become the same thing. Which one's more exothermic? comes to here, A comes to here, A drops further, A is giving off more energy, A is ex more exothermal. Because A sits higher than B over here. Did I get that right? B is more stable alkene compared to A. Um, in fact, the current coordinate diagram helps us to see all this. Very straightforward. Yep. Um, everybody good here? Why I put C below the others? Why I put B below A? Good to go? Good. I don't believe it. <laughs> yes? Um, so if you are looking at this type of graph on a, on a test, B is more thermodynamically favorable because it's great to but not as high as A, right? Like it has a lower curve height. Do you see what I'm saying? I don't know that I've really asked that question. Uh, which reaction is easier? No, it's more favorable. Oh, more favorable. No, you had a question like that on the thermodynamics thing, I uh, I reckon A would be more favorable. More exothermic? Is that what we're calling more favorable? I'll take that. Okay. I mean, A is more exothermic. Do you agree with that? Yes, sir. I would say if you're going to call, if, if, if favorable is the most exothermic, then A would be most exothermic. Right, or most favorable. Um, okay, the the heat that's given off of these both of these reactions, they're both exothermic. That's called the heat of hydrogenation. thing we did there is done here again. Uh, three different alkenes. 
which reaction gives off the most heat when uh, they're hydrogenated? Each of these alkenes gives the same alkane. Uh, well, that's the most stable, so it's going to give off the least heat. This is the least stable, so it gives off the most heat when hydrogenated. They're just showing it like this, sort of like I showed this here. They're not showing an actual reaction progress plot. Uh, Monosubstituted alkene, disubstituted alkene, uh, trisubstituted alkene, right? In terms of stability. That's the heat of hydrogenation. Now, it's exothermic, so delta H is negative. Whenever we quote heat of hydrogenation, we typically just call this a positive number. If you're going to quote it as a delta H, it's a negative number. So which one has the greatest heat of hydrogenation? Right here. Highest H of H. The most heat given off. This reaction gives off 30.3 kcal per mole. This one only gives off 26.9. So you've got to understand negative versus an absolute number. Which has a higher heat of hydrogenation, uh, left or right? Higher heat of hydrogenation. If you hydrogenate these, they both become butane. Which one? Somebody? Okay. Another one on the right, because the one on the right is going to sit higher. So it contains the most energy. It's going to sit higher, just like this. That would be A, this would be B. This is lower energy, right? Why is this one lower energy? They're both disubstituted alkenes. Here you have stereochemistry. One is cis, one is trans. Which is most stable? Trans. Trans more stable. It's like we rotated here versus here. Well, these can't rotate. They're fixed. They're stuck here. Two different compounds. They're stereoisomers. But we can still assess the two big groups being opposite. It's going to be better than the two big groups close together. This is lower energy. So it's like this. Since it's lower energy, it gives off less energy when it comes to the same thing. So which has a higher heat of hydrogenation? The one on the right, the one that gives off the most energy. Uh, while we're at it, we can answer questions like this. Which reacts faster with HBr? Not related to hydrogenation. Totally different type of question. This is a little bit apples to oranges here, just a little bit. Uh, but one of these alkenes reacts 100,000 times faster with HBr than the other. That's pretty insignificant. Which one do you think reacts faster? But the right. Right? All right. Anybody else? Why the one on the right? Tertiary carbon. Yes, when this reacts, it's going to form a tertiary carbocation. The other would form a secondary carbocation. <coughs> tertiary carbocation is much easier to form. <coughs> We could just say that's the answer and leave it at that. I don't really like the question, though, because it's a little bit apples and oranges. And if you try to graph it and do it very systematically and like I suggested and then just look at it so it's easy, it can actually be a little confusing. Because uh, they're not the same. They don't start at the same place. <coughs> And they're not going to the same place. They're, they're going to two different cations. And so you got two different cations here. But they're not starting at the same place. 
And if you just look at this, I mean, which one is hot? Which one's more stable? I reckon the one on the left. Uh, they're both die substituted. The one on the left has the groups further apart. So that's A and B. A is more stable. Well, actually, maybe it's not. Maybe it's not uh, that bad. Um, intermediate. The intermediate here is secondary intermediate, right? This tertiary intermediate. So tertiary intermediate is going to be lower. So B goes to his tertiary, and A goes to a secondary. Which reaction looks easier? Actually, B. Huh. So if we actually plot it out and think about it and do something and then step back and think fresh, it can become easy to see, right? Much easier to see if we do this rather than if we don't do what I just did. Yeah, I just realized that too here. It looks clearly that B is going to be an easier reaction. There's less energy. It, it, it starts higher and it goes to a lower place. It's easier. Yeah. Uh, that's why it reacts 100,000 times faster than the other with HBr. Uh, down below. This is even more straightforward than that one because here they both get the same product, but we don't care about the product, we care about the rate determining step. The rate determining step is formation of what? Formation of the carbocation. Both of these give the same carbocation. Can you draw the carbocation that both of these reactions give? It's the same thing. Draw it real quick. Let's look at it. <coughs> the regio selective one would be slower, right? What? The regio selective one would be slower, right? The regio selective one. I mean, the non regio selective because it could form a tertiary one and a secondary one. Yeah, but tertiary versus secondary is going to form tertiary preferred. Well, well, the top one can only form a tertiary carbocation, and the bottom one could form a secondary one. Does that make it slower? Well, you're not looking at that right on the thing. Yes, 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 this could form tertiary or secondary. But up here, this could form tertiary or primary. They both okay. have choices. Right. The choice is clear in both cases. Now maybe not as clear down here, tertiary versus secondary, it's not as not as bad as tertiary versus primary, but in both cases tertiary is going to be favorable. So I would call them both uh, regio selective. So since they both have the same cation, would it just be based on stability? Well let's let's draw the cation <coughs> and uh, if I can get a pen to break. It's, it's uh, that cation there, yeah? They both form that carbocation. If you're reacting here, the new H is there. If you're reacting here, the new H is here. They both get that. We can call this A, B, and C. Uh, C is the same. C. Which is uh, more stable, A or B? B is more stable. It's a tetra-substituted alkene. A is a di-substituted alkene. And they're constitutional isomers. Same formula. B is, B is more stable. 
uh, B, A. Uh, these become the same thing during the transition stage. At some point, they become the same exact thing. Yep. Which one's going to get to see easier? A. a. Which reacts fastest? A. Why? Because it sits higher. <coughs> You're climbing Mount, Mount Everest, right? Who's going to get to the top of Mount Everest first? Uh, person A or person B? Person B is going to get there easier, but person B has got a head start. A is ahead of B. A is higher energy, and so it's already closer to C. Yep. See here, this is going to the same place. Over here, that's why I call it apples and oranges. Until I plotted it, then I realized that it's easier. To, it, we can see it over here as well. Uh, two different alkenes going to two different cations. So again, that one over there is actually a little bit easier to do on the surface. So this is working in some of the thermodynamics type stuff. Reaction coordinate diagrams, using them. Uh, use of hydrogenation this is a positive number, where delta H is the corresponding negative number. Uh, there's just a couple of examples of hydrogenation here. Uh, this is a synthesis of Propecia. Uh, Propecia used to treat uh, hair loss. Uh, in the synthesis, there is an alkene hydrogenation or an alkene reduction uh, going from molecule 43 to 44. Alkene here. We're using platinum oxide. Uh, that's kind of a pre catalyst. With hydrogenation, platinum oxide will be converted to platinum metal. And platinum metal is the actual catalyst. And they're just reducing the alkene. Carbon carbon double bonds being reduced. Note that the carbon oxygen double bond is not being reduced. Uh, that's much more difficult and not not done usually. In organic 2 we'll see it can be done with uh, certain types of ketones and aldehydes, but usually never amides. These are amides, yeah? Well that's an amide, that's a carboxylic acid. Those are typically not reduced with hydrogenation. The only thing here is uh, reducing the alkene, and now it's gone. Uh, they did draw in one of the new H's because that carbon is chiral. Since it's chiral, it has possibilities of like a light, left and right hand, and so they're showing you something there. Um, the other new H they didn't draw in because that carbon is not chiral and there's no need to. We know there's two H's there. Um, so, it's a very common reaction, and there's an example of it being used. Uh, one other thing I wanted to show you here is, um, it's actually very similar type compounds. Uh, these are a lot of steroids. Common steroid nucleus is the four rings. Boom, 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 boom. Three of them six, and then the one five-member ring, all fused together. Uh, ultimately, most of these begin with cholesterol. Okay, make sure you eat your cholesterol so you can make your required hormones. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and then you can have stuff like testosterone. Yeah. 
Uh, right here, look at this reaction. Testosterone, the double bond in the body, is being reduced or hydrogenated. And that leads to, check out this nomenclature, testosterone, dihydrotestosterone. What does dihydro mean? Two hydrogens. Two hydrogens have been added. Seems like a reasonable name. We call it dihydrotestosterone. Right? You see the two new H's here? All right, now in the body, your body doesn't use hydrogen gas and palladium or platinum or nickel. We do that, use that in the lab. And the, your body uses enzymes. An enzyme called 5-alpha reductase is what does this. Very fascinating. Magical. Yeah, true magic there. You'll learn more in biochemistry. You'll learn steroids in biochemistry. Have you looked at them in biology yet? Yeah? Any particular one? Uh, right here. All right. So again, it's not a laboratory hydrogenation. It's a biochemical hydrogenation with an enzyme. Uh, by the way, DHT, dihydrotestosterone, has high activity in hair follicles and also the prostate gland. Um, And so you like to limit this if you want to, well, it causes BPH, prostate problems in men. It also can lead to loss of hair. Uh, have to stop those problems, you, can, you want to reduce this. You can reduce the amount of this in the body by inhibiting this enzyme. Well, different drugs target this enzyme and inhibit it. Drug on the previous page, Propecia inhibits this enzyme because Propecia is very similar in structure to testosterone. Propecia binds to the enzyme, inhibits this. You have less this and you have less uh, hair loss because this promotes hair loss and less prostate problems. Uh, so a little biochemical application there. Uh, I think that does finish up the alkene. Uh, any, anything in that handout that you'd like to go back and look at? Say ring expansion. The ring expansion. I sent that mechanism by email. Did you see that? Yeah, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Oh, I just wanted an explanation for it. Explanation for what? Yeah, that's one of the driving forces, the seven member, six member ring is more stable. Okay, stop by. <coughs> also included with that one was the mechanism for the THC. Intramolecular reaction. Uh, I know there's been a couple of questions about that one. Ultimately, pretty straightforward. Hopefully, you see that one. 
Okay, guys, Derek Chemistry. Uh, got a pink sheet. We also have the outline uh, for handout that you played yourself. Uh, the first is uh, two pages of warm-up questions, including uh, daily questions. Um, and some other intro here. Uh, Steer chemistry is very important. Uh, what's the difference between cellulose and starch? Well, your body can digest starch. Your body cannot digest cellulose. That's a huge difference. Structurally, what's the difference? Not much. They're both polysaccharides. These sugar units linked link polymer. Typically, we call sugars uh, carbohydrates. We also call them saccharides. Polysaccharides. Uh, the linkage between the individual ring, rings here and cellulose, they're both equatorial. By the way, it looks like a chair conformation. It's got an oxygen in the ring. In starch, one of them is axial, or the other is equatorial. And then this just repeats, repeats, repeats in the poly polysaccharide. That's just stereochemistry. You have the same connectivity. You've got an oxygen connected to this carbon and this carbon of each ring. Oxygen connected to this carbon and this carbon of each ring. But the projections of those bonds are different. Same connectivity, different projection of the, of the bond. That's stereochemistry. Um, can make a huge difference in chemical, biochemical processes. If we could, if we could uh, eat cellulose, we could just eat trees and stuff and we would have no food shortage. Uh, this here is going to be very important as we move along. A uh, sort of schematic here, flow chart of I isomers. Okay, Two different types of isomers mainly, constitutional and stereo. All right, constitutional different connectivity, yeah. Thus, different name. Stereoisomers have the same exact name. Because they have the same connectivity. Two different types of stereoisomers, though, in antimers and diastereomers. And antimers are mirror images, diastereomers are not. And we'll hear some terminology that goes here, this goes here. Uh, this type of stuff goes here. Uh, we said stereochemistry is important up there. Here's another example. Uh, this drug here called thalidomide. Uh, thalidomide was given to pregnant women back in the late 1950s, early 1960s, largely in Europe to treat morning sickness, nausea. Unfortunately, uh, there was a mess up in the uh, compound. When they were doing testing, they gave one in antimer, but when they started manufacturing it, they gave the mirror image, which was the other in antimer. And it turns out, while one in antimer is safe, the other in antimer is very toxic to the fetus, teratogenic, and it led to babies being born without arms or legs, or, uh, and these are some of the babies with uh, no arms, uh, basically just sort of a little appendage not a fully developed arm. Uh, and they're swim swimming there, and those are actually some of the, the better cases. In other cases, there were babies born that were uh, really in bad shape. Um, so that was thalidomide. Uh, you can maybe read about that. You can find information on Wikipedia, <coughs> et cetera. But here we go. They're mirror images. One of these is, it's like my hands here. They're mirror images. One hand is safe, the other hand, bad. Uh, sometimes that's the case. Not always. Uh, in lab this week, we're dealing with, uh, well, naproxen would be doing polarimetry on it. Uh, actual naproxen for Walmart. Um, 
only one enantiomer. The other enantiomer is toxic to the liver. Um, yeah. But with um, other drugs, both enantiomers are okay. And some drugs, both enantiomers are given. I think ibuprofen is given. Given as a 50-50 mixture. What do we call a 50-50 mixture of enantiomers? It's Racemic? Yeah, given as a racemic mixture. You would never want to give this as a racemic mixture because 50% of it would be very bad. Okay. So you would want to give a single enantiomer here. Okay, let's get into it. Uh, we've looked at it a couple of times, models. Um, pink sheet, this compound here, uh, what, what do we have here? Carbon with a methyl bromine chlorine, right? I've changed this to black here because typically carbon I like to use black for carbon chain. Uh, problem here is this carbon is tetrahedral. There's an H there, but that's not shown tetrahedral. So if we're going to do stereochemistry. We have to have actual, true tetrahedral nature. Um, let's draw this out. Let's see. We could have um, Well, typically when I do this early on, I typically draw it like this, I think. Two in the plane. Okay. And we can call this one bromine. We'll just make that one the methyl. Uh, one forward here. Let's draw the chlorine forward. And then the H here is going to be, by default at this point, back, right? Yeah. Now we have a nice looking tetrahedral carbon showing the appropriate bonds projections. Yeah. Uh, what about the mirror image of this? Everything's got a mirror image, even, even paper clips. Right? Okay. Um, Mirror image, what would that look like? So if this looked in the mirror, what would it see? I'm going to move this a little bit. Those look like they're mirroring. I think so. Those are supposed to be mirror images. Okay. <laughs> now I've got an actual tetrahedral here. Now I can say, okay, uh, bromine green. Here we go. Bromine green, carbon this way. So the black and the green are in the plane of the board. Chlorine red coming out, and the H is gray going back. So that's that one. That's that one, right? Now this is a mirror image. No. Mirroring, yeah. Is it this one? Yes. Carbon this way. Bromine green straight up. H gray going back. Chlorine <coughs> red coming forward. So that's them on the board, right? This is them in my hand. Same or different? Well, to answer that, we say, are they superimposable? If this was like a hologram, could you move it and put it right over top of the other one? Flip it around, anything? I don't know. Let's see. Same or different? Uh, same or different? Well, they should stack, and that's called, are they superimposable? 
Okay, the, the saucers in your cupboard will stack because they're the same thing. All right, superimposable. Are they? Boom. Yes. The gray and the green line up. Uh oh. Red and the black don't. Well, we can fix that, right? We can make those line up. Yes, done, right? Uh oh, now the green and the gray don't line up. They're not the same thing. Because if they were, you'd be able to just put this hologram and the holograms right on top of each other. Not the same thing. They're not superimposable. Those are just like my hands. They're not the same thing. Can I stack them? No. I got a thumb on one side and a thumb on the other. We also know that if I had a right hand glove, only one of these will fit into the right hand glove. This one. That means this is different. How are they similar? They have the same connectivity. I got a pointy finger and I got a thumb right next to it. Pointy finger and a thumb right next to it. It's just all inverted. It's the mirror image. Mirror images that are different are called what? They're called an antimers. They're stereoisomers. They have the same connectivity. This is a carbon with the same four groups connected to it. These guys have the same name. We'll repeat this stuff over and over. I, I call this my right hand and left hand. You know the difference. How can we distinguish those two? Because they both have this name right here. There's a couple of ways to distinguish. One of them is to define the configuration of the chiral carbon. What is a chiral carbon? Often I will star them, and a lot of people in books will star the chiral car carbon. And we need to answer this. Why are these different? We said the mirror images are different. The mirror image of that is that, right? If that looks in the mirror, it's going to be mirroring. Those are mirror images. Same or different? Same. same. It's the same paper clip. It's two identical paper clips. Why are these mirror images the same but those different? A plane of symmetry. This has a plane of symmetry. I can slice right through it and have half on one side, half on the other. It actually has two planes of symmetry. One right through here, but I could also slice it right through here. It only takes one of plane of symmetry, though. Does this have a plane of symmetry? No. I cannot slice it right through here. I'd have red on one side, green on the other. I cannot slice it right through here. I'd have gray on one side, black on the other. There is no plane of symmetry. If there's no plane of symmetry, the mirror image will be different. All right? How do we know there's no plane of symmetry here? Well, we'll learn. Here's a quick, easy way. It's got a chiral carbon. A chiral carbon is a site of asymmetry. That means there's no symmetry at this carbon because it's got four different things to touch. <coughs> it's in a tetrahedral or non-planar arrangement. Four different things attached on a tetrahedral carbon is chiral. That means it's asymmetric. That ruins the symmetry. A compound with one chiral carbon will always be chiral. This is called a chiral compound, meaning the mirror image is different. Now, if you have two chiral carbons, it, the mirror image could be the same. Because the two chiral carbons could mirror each other. But if you only have one, it's always going to be chiral. We'll say these things over and over. Most of what I've just said up to now is in the paragraph above in my own words. Okay, let's move ahead and we'll solidify this. By the way, what do we call these? They both have the same name. You've got to have a name that distinguishes them, distinguishes them or you'll never know what you, what you have. Okay, this is my right hand, this is my left hand. We do R and S. What is R and S? We determine the configuration at the chiral carbon. How are the things connected? We do this by first determining the priority of the four groups. And this is done just like easy nomenclature. 
by atomic number. Which of the four groups here have the highest atomic number? Bromine is one. Chlorine is two. Carbon is three. H is four. Just like with the EZ nomenclature. All right. Now you say, with the, high with the low priority group in the back, low priority group in back, low priority group in back, going away, is the one, two, three clockwise or counterclockwise? One, two, three. Clockwise, correct? Clockwise is an R configuration. Uh, also known as right. Oh, the, the, the dial turns to the right. I think it's Greek or something or some language. Rectus? <coughs> Is that right? Anybody know? <coughs> In any event, that's R. Okay, over here, that's still one, two, three. Low priority group in the back, correct? How's the one, two, three? Okay. It's counterclockwise. Well, counterclockwise is S. And I think, I think that's, uh, well, that's left, but it's not L. I think S comes from sinister, I think. And sinister, the left-handed people were called sinister. I think that's where that came from. Or maybe I'm making it up. Uh, that's R, and that's S configurations of chiral carbons. And so what we do is we would say one of them is R, one bromine, one chloride thing. The other one is S, one bromine, one chloride thing. And that's how we do it with stereoisomers. They all have the same exact name. But we put some type of stereochemical descriptor in front of the name to clarify which stereoisomer we're talking about. <coughs> we'll do more examples of that. And enters of the next compound. The question here really is, is this compound chiral? That's chiral. It's got two different enantiomers. Is this compound chiral? No. no. It doesn't have a chiral carbon. Okay? If we make both of these bromines, does this have a mirror image? Yes, everything's got a mirror image. Except for it. Oh, no, no, the store has one now. Um, is that a mirror image? No. No, those are not mirroring. How about them? Mirror images? Yeah, same or different? Same. Superimpose? No, they don't superimpose. Green and green? Black and gray aren't lining up. Ah, oh, like that. Look at there. That's called superimposing. You see how they're right on top? It's like two of the same things right on top. But you see how I switched to, I just turned it. What allowed me to turn it? The fact that it has symmetry, I can just do that. It has symmetry because look, except for the broken tip there, I can slice right through here and have green on one side, green on the other, okay? Half a gray, half a gray, half a black, half a black. I can slice right through there. I cannot slice right through here because I have gray on one side, black on the other. But, but I can here, and all it takes is one plane of symmetry. <coughs> this has a plane of symmetry, and thus the mirror image is going to be <coughs> the same. Just like this. This is not two different compounds. It's the same thing. I could draw them both like that, but it's two of the same thing in that case. Just like I can draw my right hand like this, and then I can come and draw my right hand like that. It's still the same right hand. I've only got one hand on the board. I could draw the right hand like that. What if I drew it all these ways? I'd say, okay, how many different hands on the board? The answer would be one. It's just drawn different ways. Okay. More coming. And antimers have identical physical properties, such as melting point, boiling point, dipole moment, density, etc. These two are going to have the same exact boiling point. 
Because the I and F's are the same. It's just inverted. What are any exceptions? How do they differ? One is a very interesting difference here. Uh, it's kind of a quirk of science, but it's very useful. And antimers rotate plane polarized light in equal but opposite directions. One of them rotates light to the uh, right. That's called the dextrorotatory isomer, also abbreviated as D. And the right is known as the positive direction. The other one rotates light to the left. That's called uh, levorotatory or L, and that would be the negative direction. Basically, light is shined in this thing, and maybe it veers off towards the chlorine for some reason. Electronic interaction between the electromagnetic spectrum and the electrons of the halogen. So light coming in and boom, here to the right. Where over here, light comes in and boom, it veers to the chlorine, but that's to the left over here. Now, I don't know which is which is which here, which is plus, which is minus, but that's how you can get the variation. Another difference is enantiomers interact with chiral objects differently. By the way, we'll be looking at more of this. This is so-called the uh, optical activity of enantiomers. The optics, the light of enantiomers. We'll be looking at that. Finish up here. Please be looking ahead. There's a couple of problems, okay? Finish up here, though. Uh, another is that they interact with chiral objects differently. Okay? A glove is chiral. My hands are chiral. Do my hands interact with the glove differently? Yes, only this one will interact with the glove, the right-handed glove. This one will not interact with the right-handed glove. That's an example of number two. My chiral hands interacting with the chiral glove differently. That's very important for drug action. And that's why thalidomide with one enantiomer was terribly toxic and the other one was okay. Okay, guys, have a good day. I'm sorry, you didn't turn in your uh, worksheet? Yeah, I forgot to turn in your worksheet, yeah.